Hey, real quick, everybody. This is P.A. Turner from the Break It Down Show, doing my intro live today from LAX Terminal. That's the power of the Bulletproof Podcast, an SM35 microphone from Shure, and a Zoom H6. So here, check it out. Today's guest is Robin Drake. He's been on three times before. He's a former counterintelligence, just like myself. He did his work with the FBI. And here in the States, I did my work abroad. We talk about our ability to influence people through building trust. And now he's got a new book called Sizing People Up based upon their actions and reactions. And if you build a trusting relationship, you're able to figure out people in a lot faster ways than normal, a lot more reliably too. Hey, you're going to love this episode. I, I just cannot say enough positive things about Robin. And I know no matter what, even if you're not a spy, his books will help you in the business world. So definitely check them out as Code of Trust and Sizing People Up. All right, real quick, support the show, share the show, tell your friends about it. By the just a quick note on sharing the show, share the show, comment on it. If you comment, that helps continue to buy the books like you've been doing, continue to do the great things you're doing. And if you're new, welcome. We have so many episodes. Feel free to ask me for a recommendation after you listen to this one, because I know you'll find it interesting. Hit me up at Pete A. Turner or Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. All right. Save the brave. Save the brave.org. Drop a little money in our pockets each month. We'll put it to work. Saving veterans lives. All right. Thank you guys so much. Here comes Robin Drake. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbin. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan This East. is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hey, this is Robin Dreek, and you're listening to the Break It Down Show. This is the second try. I screwed the last one up. I don't know what I did wrong, but we're recording again with Robin and in announcing his book, Sizing People Up. It's his latest book. And I just, first off, I can't get enough of you, Robin. I love how we both approach our very complex and dangerous jobs by, by focusing on trust, by focusing on how, you know, how do I understand what you need? I, I call it the infrastructure of the mind. You know, you call it your own thing, but we get to the same spot. And I, I just, I love it when we get a chance to share our, our, our conversations. Yeah. I love it too, Pete. You know, you did most of your stuff. Oconus. I did all my stuff. Conus and, and you're right, you know, human interpersonal interactions. I, I think when we're very young, when we start out in these professions, we really try to overcomplicate things because, you know, we sit there in these master classes with these people down, dousing us with all this knowledge, all these techniques, all these tools, all these things, you know, for like six, eight months at a time sometimes. And we think this is very complicated. But then when you actually go out to the world of practical application, you actually whittle it down to learning how to be the person you were hired to be to begin with. You were hired because you were a good human being. Right. And, you, and it comes down to what do good human beings do? Well, good human beings know how to demonstrate value and demonstrate the affiliation with others. You know, and that's it. You know, you build trust and you build a healthy relationship because without those, you will have nothing. Now, I always say, you know, I think I said the last time we were together too, you know, I worked with confidential human sources. They're the bread and butter of working counterintelligence, they're the bread and butter of ter- counterterrorism, bread and butter of criminal work, bread and butter of life. And so I always say I'd rather have seven people give me 120% of their effort willingly than 100 people give me 5% reluctantly because I have to, I have to have triple sources to figure out whether the, that 5% was lying or not. It's much better to have 7%, you know, I mean, seven people give me all that effort because I, it, the, the, the veracity is there because they want to be part of it. And how do you do that? Healthy relationships and trust. Yeah, it, it's, boy, yeah, it, <laughs> it's exactly right. You can go around and try to trick and convince and control a conversation to, to find out a fact that you still have to triple triple check it because you just don't yeah. know, you know? And, and then the problem with that is, is, is I never, you know, one of the things I always talk about is I never think about just the person I'm interacting with because they're obviously first and foremost in developing that trust and relationship. But also I am thinking about from that point forward, as soon as I break contact with this individual, what's my brand? Because they're now going to radiate through the rest of their day, week and months ahead the relationship and the engagement we just had. And if you leave them feeling better for having met you, then the brand is good. Even if they don't want, if, even if they don't want to cooperate, maybe someone they're talking to will, because they hear about this FBI guy that is, wow, he's a really good guy. I didn't want to, I didn't want to cooperate with the FBI, but you know what? I would meet with him any time of day because he bought me a beer and he treated me really well. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's so it's true. It's the simplest thing. 
the um the interactions like i would have interactions with folks that didn't have enough stuff that you know basically an uh, armed biker gang shows up at their house you know so i always had to work within that paradigm and, and, and like it's almost like dating you know like if you see someone who's attractive at a at a bar or or a mixer of some kind you know you're not getting that real person right away you you're getting right. a performance of that person and so i always kind of took that like they expect me to be this this, they expect me to be a spy, whether I am or not. That's where they start, and they don't necessarily have to trust me. They'll act like it, but if I don't, if I don't start with that, like they're not going to trust me right away. They're going to perform. The sooner I can get them to be genuine, the better off I am in getting quality information out of them. And then also, maybe they don't know everything in the world. Maybe they just know a piece of something or an element of it. I don't want them trying to wow me with what they don't know because they because they're enamored with talking to me or whatever uh, i, I want to understand who they are so that i can find out what benefits them and then get introduced to the next person in line because that person's an important part of my yep. network but they're not the last node you know and that's that goes that you know that old uh wives tale thing you know the six degrees of separation of kevin bacon yeah you know that's what you know you know as someone who knows something who knows something you know, because here's the guarantee I always believed, you know, with my, you know, when I retired, I had seven beautiful confidential human sources that were fantastic human beings. I guarantee you, I could find out any piece of information we ever needed. Anytime we had a new collection requirement come out, I knew exactly I could get it. Yeah. And these seven people wouldn't have it, but they'd know someone who knew someone who had it. I generally, I never had to go deeper than two layers of separation to find something out. And, and sometimes, and here's the funny thing that what I realized towards the end of my career it used to take like, you know, I get a collection requirement for, for whatever it is, whatever in, Intel gap we had. And it might take me six to eight months to, you know, find the right person that might know that. Right. And by the time I retired, it was down to like a week or two. Just because, and why? Because the depth of, and of the trust and the relationships that you have makes things happen even faster. Because what happens is when people want to interact with you, they're thinking all about you and your priorities all the time anyway. And so they're coming up with ideas. You know, it's, you know, one of my best questions always at the end of every meeting is, so what didn't I ask you that you think I need to know? <laughs> I got my hands in the air. I ask that all the time. <laughs> yeah. What don't I know that you think I need to know that I never even bothered asking you? Yeah. You know, and that's where the gold comes out because the bad guys know exactly what you should know a hell of a lot more than you do. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's such a powerful question. Yeah. Like what question did I ask you that I should ask you or, um, I would use what's just the simplest thing that we could solve today, tomorrow. What's the easiest oh, that's good. thing? Yeah, and then they'll say, "Oh, well, you know, this road has ruts in it and it's breaking our cars. If we could fix that road, I'm like fix the fucking road, is that it? You know, done. You know, and what and what did you just do? You actually sought their thoughts and opinions about a priority. Yeah. You know, because again, my, my my four mantras for how to make a conversation about everyone else but yourself is seek their thoughts and opinions, talk in terms of their priorities validate their thoughts and opinions and who they are without judging them and give them choices. And in that one simple statement and question, you know, I, I call discovery questions. You got exactly that and you became a resource for their success and prosperity without expectation or reciprocity. So bingo. Yeah. And, and again, here we go. Ready? I'm, I'm going to hit the ball right back to you with the same thing. I, I discovered that one of the most powerful questions I had, and I said it in Arabic all the time, was Shunu Rayek. What's your opinion? And oh yes. Asking their opinion on something, it's the same same tool and they couldn't help but start to explain this whole thing and then now with without controlling them, I'm absolutely in control of where this conversation is going and and I'm getting you know an insightful answer that they've probably been dying to tell someone. And you're and you're getting their context yeah. and you're understanding them. And so here's what's really, you know, you take this to the next level that a lot of people have a hard time doing sometimes because it's anti-intuitive. And that is most of the time when we're interacting with other people, we, we, we want to tell them our thoughts and opinions. We're trying to how do we convince them to listen to us? Yes. And you can't. And so the beautiful thing is you, you just did it. Seek their thoughts and opinions. Well, if you want them to listen to what it is you want to tell them, best thing to do is ask them what they think about what you want to tell them <laughs> and now and their brains engaged you know i always say you, you don't plant seeds with people by asking them i mean you don't plant seeds with people by telling them what you think you plant seeds by asking them what they think and yeah. they'll remember it forever that your first your first book that we talked about was code of trust not your first book ever but the, the when we right. first met was code of trust and that's where we like we started realizing we vibed and we had independently kind of discovered these things doing you know a similar job in name, counterintelligence, but a totally different application of the job. 
Uh, yep. What's this new book, Sizing People Up? What is that about? So that, that's actually taken it to the next level where I found when I was doing the code of trust, which was, all right, what behaviors do I need to do and do I need to have so I can uh, inspire someone to want to trust me and have a relationship with me? And it required a hell of a lot of focus on the other person. And when, what I found is, is over time, when I'm focusing so hard on the other person, people be, started becoming kind of predictable. And predictable in the sense that, you know, here's another truth is that all human beings will always, always take actions in their own best interest for safety, security and prosperity. And so now what I was doing in the code of trust was I was trying to understand how they saw safety and security and prosperity from their point of view. And so I started saying, well, I can actually I can predict what every human being is going to do. They're always going to act in their own best interest. All I got to do is figure out what they think is in their best interest. And so that's where size in action. That's where sizing people up came from. It's it's about how to predict trust, but at a at a more uh, gritty level. Trust is kind of subjective. So, and a lot of people um, make the mistake of using liking someone to trusting someone, and that's very subjective. And just because you like someone doesn't mean you can trust them. Because what I do is I redefine trust as predictability. We really predict someone's going to do in situations, and for the main purpose, we go back to relationships again. Because if I set a bar for someone and I set it too high because I hope they're going to do better or I like them and they fall short of that, what happens? The relationship goes south because I'm angry, discontent, um, frustrated. And so the whole the whole purpose of this is so I can reasonably expect what I can expect you to do in these different situations so that you're going to meet the bar or exceed it. And also because I'm so focused on understanding you, if, it, if you don't meet the bar, I mean something went sideways in your life and I need the, a resource for you there. So this is about creating and maintaining deeper understanding of others. Yeah. And, and again, you know, <laughs> same thing, like as always, I, I think we talked about this in the, in the show that didn't record, but my cross collaboration, cultural matrix, you know, if you understand the decision-making <laughs> process and the goals like, of someone, it's a complex collaborative, word. <laughs> right? Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And when, if you're not, you're going to get these outcomes, passive aggressive behavior, uh, perceptions of incompetence or, uh, Oh Yeah. You know, did you, and it may vary on like on the scenario, but you, these other outcomes. So when you hear back, like this person's incompetent, that's one of the other ones. Um, you should now be alerted. Hey, I need to slow down and spend more time understanding what their goals are, how they make their decisions, so that we can get some congruence, and then also take time to explain my goals, my outcomes, and see where those things line up. That must resonate with you all day long. Yeah, absolutely. Matter of fact, um, you're talking about competence. That's part of sign three for me, which is reliability. Reliability is a combination of um, competence as well as diligence. You know, competence, so they have the skill sets required to do it and diligence, so they have the tenacity to actually follow through and actually do it. Yeah. So, the, yeah. So these six signs I have, the first one is vesting. What Are they actually using words, language and actions that are actually demonstrating that they're interested in you being successful along with them. Right. The second one is longevity. Are they using action words and language that says they're looking for a long-standing relationship? Three is the reliability, which we were just talking about, which is a combination of competence and diligence. Actions. Actions is that whole past patterns of uh, repeated behaviors. If I see you do something two, three, four times, the likelihood of you doing it the same way five or six times is pretty dang high. Right. Um, five is language. Are they using so in the code of trust? I, I we just went through it. The four things I'd love to use is language. You know, am I seeking their thoughts and opinions? Talking in terms of their priorities, validating, giving them choices. Are they using that now with me? So I want to see if they're actually demonstrating value and relation to me. And finally, the last one is uh, stability, emotional stability. So when faced with stress, anxiety, and all the negative emotions, do they maintain the cognitive thought process or do they go off the rails and they become unpredictable? So you don't have to have all six of those signs, but if you have one or two of them really, really strong in a certain lane, that's also important. Just because they can do something in one area doesn't mean you can trust them at all. I think I used last time with you, I love using the the flying scenario. Mm. You know, I like Pete. Pete's yeah. a great guy. We got, you know, we have this area in common, but, you know, if Pete's not a pilot and I am, and I throw the keys to a plane you know, we're going to die. <laughs> yes. So I, I love keeping that very fragmented, you know, segmented, I should say in lanes so I can understand what things I could, you know, trust you with, you know, predict your behavior with and what things I should stay away from again, for the whole purpose, maintaining a great, healthy relationship. That, um, and it's going back a little bit in time and it kind of covers back to the, the, the past book, but I, I think it's an important thing to point out is trust is measurable. 
and it has different elements to it. So rapport would be for me a subset of trust. And then you can have low risk trust. And then you can say, Hey, I'm going to give you a shot. Like you're extending someone trust. Doesn't mean you have it. You're kind of like, here, I'll invest this in this relationship. And if you return back a response that I expect, now we have trust. And so you, you, you take that motion and flip it around and you watch your partner and you see, do they respond, like you said, in a pattern that makes sense to me? And if not, you slow down and you say, hey, you're not taking this action that should be beneficial to you. Why is that? Right. And you don't judge it. You know, right. it keeps going back into the core thing. It's like, all right, um, we're falling short in a lane here. You know, is that because of my lack of instruction and training I provided? Is it because you're not invested with uh, with us and our priorities? Is that because you're looking for this as a short term goal or vice a long term engagement? You know, there's all these different things. And what it does is keeps you thinking and focused on them rather than have an emotional reaction response where you just want to get angry. Um, I, I just love it to death because, again, it, again, it keeps you cognitive. It keeps you thinking and keeps that horrible emotional hijacking from happening both to you and, and also to them, because yeah. then because when they don't fear being ostracized, and they don't fear being shoved out of the tribe then they're going to perform their best as well. Boy, being shoved out of the tribe, that's powerful. <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, especially like for, for folks in the worlds that I've worked in, standing out gets you killed. And yeah, so, yeah. you know, they make communal decisions. You don't flaunt your wealth. You know, you, you, you keep your head below the other head so you don't get your head chopped off. Right. My, my philosophy is always don't be the first line and don't be the last. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hey, in, in, um, in chapter one, you, you, talk about looking for signs of desperation. I wanted to ask you about that because where I'm at, there's a lot of desperate people uh, and you are trying to sort out like maybe this is their one chance to talk to an American. And so they'll say and do anything to extend that conversation because it might mean money, their life, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a, that's a rough one because you're exactly right. When people are desperate, and I, I face this a lot um, when I was in New York, you know, working my first couple of years there because we had, we had some, potential confidential human sources. And we actually had one or two that had been on board with us for a number of years, but their access had uh, fallen off. Right. And they, had, they were getting pretty substantial sustained payments from us, which they actually started making a part of their living style. Uh-oh. And when, you, when, they, when their access started uh, waning, and now you have, it was a worst case scenario of everything because their access was waning. So they're desperate to provide information. And so they start providing open source stuff that you can get anywhere right. and they're, and they're trying to pass it off as insider knowledge. And then when you actually have handlers that are now emotionally vested in, in the success of the relationship and the case, now they're actually believing the shit because they're trying to, you know, bolster their own careers and value of what it is they're doing instead of having an objective look at what's going on. So yeah, desperation can be um, bad on for a lot of people. What, what do you, so you're saying um, access. So guys like us, we look for placement and access. Uh, mm-hmm. We can discuss that another time, but that, that's a key thing that that's like, that's our trading stock. Like that's what we want to find. Someone has got placement and access to the information or people we, we need to meet with. Um, but as that access or that placement changes, you know, how do you set that person down? And, and not use them as much. How do you, you know, we say terminate with prejudice or whatever, but you still have to live and work in New York, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I, I always had, a, I always looked at it kind of differently. I looked at it from the point of view, like whether it was someone that actually walked in, you know, and contacted me to volunteer, but they didn't have access to anything yet, or with someone that lost access, but was still willing to be a patriot. I always looked at it as it's my obligation to help you find a job. Yeah. You know, if you're, if you're trying to do something patriotic, whether you had access and lost it or you don't have it, and you're trying to get it. Let's come up with operations together based on what my knowledge I have and based what you naturally do that we can kind of collide these things together. It might happen in a couple of days, might happen in a couple of weeks or maybe a couple of years, but I'll maintain contact and, and I'll keep sense. What I always do is I keep sensitizing them towards areas of interest and priorities that we have in Intel gaps, knowledge gaps. And I sensitize this network, you know, because if not today, maybe tomorrow. And again, if they're if they want to desperately be of help and a resource, they might not be the right person, but they're going to know somebody, know someone kind of thing. Right. So they're, they, they, they enjoy becoming a conduit and a facilitator of, of other things and other people. So I would never, I never had an instance where I cut someone off and said, oh, you know what, I'm done with you because again, I treat everyone as, as a great human being and 
And if you're willing to do something that puts yourself at, you know, at a disadvantage, either professionally or personally, to do something for national security, I will. I, I never treated anyone like that. I just, right. you know, and I, I, I can honestly tell you, every human being that I ever worked with, um, I could pick up a phone and and still call half of them right now, and we're still great friends. So hell, I'm still in touch with half of them, right? You know, over the years, you know, because again, I, I didn't work the world of terrorism or or. Crim, I, I work counterintelligence, and these people are very, very good human beings. As a matter of fact, even in the book, you know, so I t- talk about a number of them in the book, and one of them, you know, the one that's uh, based off the world where preventing World War Three scenario in the book is called Anon. I was literally emailing them two days ago. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, and, and it won't surprise you. I'm in the same boat where even if I don't have continued contact, if I showed up in certain parts of Iraq, I would be open with open arms, like just welcome yep. back. They would love to see me, you know, because you never abused people. Yeah, it was real. Human beings are real, you know, and and, it's, and see, I had the benefit of I generally, you know, since I'm domestic, I had the ability to be patient. And so patience goes a long way. And I know, and that's why the fact that you're able to do it is I know anytime you're Oconus, you know, you're, you're on a time constraint. A lot of times you need action but Intel fast. It's very, very, that's, that's the most challenging situations to do it in because you have to build relationships on a tempo that's might not be the tempo the other person wants, yeah. but you mitigate that. And I think what you probably did is you mitigate that through transparency, you know? So, because if you, Otherwise, you're manipulating time, and that looks controlled to someone else, and shields go up. But if you can be transparent with the fact that, listen, I need something now because of X, Y, and Z. Well, now you're transparent. You got do have a time time constraint, and now you empower them with choice about how to move forward. You know, one of the things I tried to do is I tried to bring in, like, I would stop myself, and and and, and you know, we've talked about this. I've learned all this by making all the mistakes and making yes. them repeatedly, you know? So. <laughs> yes. I call my, my books on my manuals on how not to be the moron I was born to be. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. My, uh, my, uh, my bonsai tree of life and mistakes is just a stick now. Like there's, just, <laughs> there's nothing left to prune off. <laughs> That's really good. <laughs> but uh, I, I would, I would try to like, what, what, what's normal in this situation? Like I can't just show up at some government official's desk unannounced with a bunch of dudes with guns and expect to have a meeting whenever I want. So I started saying, <laughs> Hey, can I get some of your time when you've got it? And they would go, Holy shit. You're asking me for an appointment. I'm like, yes. Well, you know, I've got a budget meeting and I'm like, Oh yeah. Budget. Got it. Yeah. When, when can I come in and not be in, in you know, a bother, but right. you know, hopefully in the next week. And then they would always oblige me. And then I would say, you know, I got to be very careful about this because I, you know, I'm not supposed to give you advance notice. And so I, I would validate the trust that I extended them, and they would always yep. return it back, always, yep. always, every single time. And so the, it, it, you started out with us that fourth step I have: empower them with choice. I did the same exact thing, you know, because you, we only give choice to the people that we want to affiliate with and that we want to value. I, yeah. My my final statement I always left everyone with was: and if you don't want any more contact from me, just let me know, and I'll make a note never to bother you again. Yeah. And I've never had anyone walk away. I mean, that freaks people out. It's like, oh, you can't tell me you can walk away, but why not? If they don't want to, yeah. I, I don't want, I don't want a 5%er. I want a 120%er. Yeah. You know, and I want them to know, you know, the other thing I always made sure too is, I always, I, especially after first contacts, I say, please, if you have any questions, let me know because the worst thing that can happen is you walk away and you say to yourself, I wonder what he really wanted. Yeah. Because then you're not trusting me. Then you don't think I'm transparent and open. And yeah. that, that's, that's a deal breaker, you know? And that, so these are these are all what I call relationship accelerators. Mm. You know, when you're this kind of transparent, and and again, if I can't be transparent about something because it's classified or because it needs to protect people, I can tell you I can't be transparent because of this, and yeah. you're still being transparent. <laughs> it's great. It's pretty incredible. Yeah, I had a sense for um, I could build reliably build trust with a a partner in a foreign country. Um, it, it would take let's say ninety days. That's how long it took before. And, and you know, we're talking like high risk trust where mm-hmm. I will I will go do things. It didn't mean I didn't do things that were risky before that, but that's when I knew I reliably had it because I had gone through the process. Now, could I have done it faster? Maybe, but there were plenty of times when I thought I had trust and then I realized later on, oh my God, now I have it. What, what did I have before? You know, you have like this lower level. Talk a little bit about how do you validate that trust and those behaviors that you were talking about earlier. Put that together in, in a way that we can understand it. 
where do you accelerate it? Yeah, yeah, like like to get trust, to build trust reliably, to test it, and to do it as you know as quickly as is is normally possible. So the accelerate. So it's I'm kind of looking at the question in two parts. The first are what I call relationship accelerators, and you know if you need to develop trust in a relationship rapidly. You know, matter of fact, I'm, I'm going to tell you exactly where I get this from. A guy by the name of Jack Schaefer, who was on my behavioral team with me, he wrote the book called The Like Switch. And when we were on the team together, he came up with these these things. He goes, the first thing you can do is time. You know, you know, spend the more time you spend with someone, the the greater the accelerator. You know, so you can't be you know a five minute meeting. It's got to be like an hour long meeting. Right. On uh, the second, the second is proximity. Are you are you communicating via snail mail? via text, via email, or in person. Mm. You know, the, the closer the proximity, the greater the accelerator. And the third, which is going to kind of link then to the other area you're talking about, and that is uh, intensity. Mm. What topics of conversation are you talking about that you're relying upon on each other for? You know, so the deeper those start going and the more that people have on the line, those intensify fires where now you have shared common backgrounds, you have shared common stress, yes. those are relationship intensifiers. And so the test, what I would say is that the degree of willingness and pushback you get or don't get when the intensifiers get introduced. So I would, I would call it just a, a willingness in that, again, are we at 5% of, of wanting to do something or are we 120%? I'd say you, you have that high degree when they're coming up with ideas that might not be in their personal or professional best interest, but they're willing to do it anyway. Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. That might not be in their personal or professional best interest, but they're willing to do it anyway. I'd say that's the highest degree. Yeah, no, I I think you're right, and and I I use the common tool sort of within what some part of what you were saying is is just fence joining. Like we're both building fences, but mm-hmm. you see me build my fence, I see you build yours, and the sooner I can start to go, oh, you have a daughter, I have a daughter. What do you do with your daughter for fun? You know, and then you start oh, yeah. joining your fences together until now you're yep. building a fence together. Yep. That's and that's, and that's sign one in, in sizing people up vesting, yeah. you know, or how, how vested are they in your success as much as they are on their own? Are they coming up with ideas? Are, in other words, are they joining fences with your fences? And I remember, you know, the, one of my first recruitments I ever did was a, a, a foreign intelligence officer from, I don't want to give away too much, but it was from a, a former Soviet Republic, you know, one of the, one of the Stan like things. And I remember we talked, our, we had great bonding because we both have kids. I, I think one of those common things I talk about anyone from any part of the world, I have my two favorites are I talk about children because I suffer proud parent syndrome. You know, I got two kids, yeah. you know, very successful. My son's at the Naval Academy. My daughter's graduate from George Mason as a nurse, you know, in a couple months, you know, and so you either were a kid, have kids, no kids, you know, or you were a child yourself growing up, you know, so I love talking to kids. The other one is also uh, family traditions, you know, growing up. We don't have necessarily the same family traditions, but you have a tradition of some sort. You know, I love hearing about traditions because we can share our traditions together and maybe overlap a few of them. Right. Um, so those, I love making those connections like that. And then they're, and they're great intensifiers. In your book, and I think it's in the, in the chapter two in the takeaway part, you, you start to break down and, and you do it in the chapter as well. Intuition. And people often talk about oh, their yeah. gut and how they're good at sizing right. people up. But you know, uh, let me see if I can say this right. Gut to me equals emotion, and emotion yeah. is often, you know, fallible. What, what are your thoughts? Absolutely. Matter of fact, um, I never delve into the world of politics um, openly just because, you know, as soon as you take a side, half the world's going to line up against you and it's going to get really nasty and fast these days. That being said, let's talk about Trump briefly. All right. Not politically, but let's take a look at. You know, he you know, here's my theory why Trump is so divisive. And it's not because of any. Now, people can argue this. It's not because of anything he did after he was elected. It's because he was so well known. I think he was the most well known presidential candidate in our history prior to being a candidate. And so before that, what happened was people either chose to like him or dislike. 
like him. Mm. And once you like someone, everything they say and do, you're in favor of. Once you dislike someone, there's nothing they can say or do that you agree with. Right. And so therein lies a great divide before he even became president. Right. And and I, I test this theory all the time. It's like uh, even with my daughter, you know, I, I asked my daughter the other day, I said, hey, you know, as I'm testing this out, because you know, I'm writing an article on this, you know, try not to be political, but try to analyze why so divisive. And because because people are kind of laying it on, on his language he's using now. Okay. But I'm it's saying it happened long before then. It happened because that's liking. People had an intuition. And once they decide they like someone or dislike something, that's emotional. And all the things they do, the cognitive, thoughtful things, they're not even being regarded. Mm. And so that's that's my theory there. So it kind of goes into that thing we're just talking about. It's intuition. It's a deal breaker. Because once you use intuition, you might be right, you might be wrong, but it's not based on any ob- observable data or facts. It's based on a gut feeling. And... And it's based on our own morals, our own ethics. And I mean, most people like people because of morals and ethics right. and having similar ones. And if you display dissimilar ones, there's nothing you can do about it from that point. I mean, I, I know very few people can overcome disliking someone and actually pay attention to the actual content of their delivery. But there is something that you can perceive, even if it's subconsciously about people. I mean, there is something to the intuition, the gut. Um, yep. People talk about it all the time. How do you factor in that? I mean, you don't want to ignore your sense of something because you could be detecting a, a problem. Sure. I think if you categorize you know, your, the emotions you have and can be analytical about it, it can work very effectively for you. So here's another piece of intuition that people have that is actually can be extremely accurate, and that is congruence, I call it. Congruence between the words being said and the nonverbal language you're getting along with it. You know, this is like the creepy car salesman. You know, the guy is saying he, all the right things and you think you're a really great wordsmith and you're going to listen to all the, the th- things he's saying wrong. But man, he's saying everything completely right. But why don't I trust him? Well, it's because his nonverbals were saying, I'm going to take advantage of you and steal your money. <laughs> so, you know, as human beings, we, we always pick up on nonverbal cues. And when our words are congruent with our nonverbal cues, that's our intuition that we can trust them. And that can actually is pretty accurate, mm-hmm. you know, but if we can give it the label and meaning before time, we can actually give it some more data and some more substance. And so what happens is, is people kind of group their intuition all into one when actually there's a lot of things I think that play into intuition, liking someone, also nonverbal cues, language, all these things. So if you can start, again, giving things lanes so you exactly know where you stand, but, but also the most important thing I think we can all do is Try to do any of this alone. Yeah, it always takes a beta tester. It takes a team. It takes groups that are and individuals that are objective and not emotionally vested in something that someone else might not be. So that's why I'm good at doing a lot of this stuff. But any time of something of consequence comes up where it's going to be a communication uh, with someone in any way that's going to be a little bit out of the normal, a little bit more important, before I do anything, I'm always um, beta testing it. I'm having someone listen to me do it feedback i'm having them deliver it to me so i can see how it feels coming back at me role playing role playing is so vitally important to this to, to give it the best most thorough test you possibly can before you uh, roll it out i uh <laughs> i totally agree what a su- what a surprise <laughs> i would often I mean, if you saw, I always said, like, if you saw me working, you would never know I was working, you know, because it would look like I was having a great conversation with someone. And if you saw me on the camp, I was probably talking out loud to myself, working through questions. (laughs) Oh, yeah. And and I I started at the outcome, and then I worked my way up the conversation chain. So if I want to know where are the bombs, I don't say, where are the bombs? You know, I figure out the 10 questions that lead up to the obvious thing where they're like, oh, let me tell you where the bombs are, you know, like, and I, I'm using a very simplistic answer. I mean, there's there's a lot of outcomes I'm looking for. And so there's all these conversation streams that I'm trying to get into. But again, well, yeah, through trust and everything else, you know, so. I'm- well, and the funny thing is that you're doing it very easily because, you know, where are the bombs? What's that question actually answering? And being part of it. it's being part of his safety, security, and prosperity, either for him, himself, or his, or his family. So the the discovery questions you're asking is basically, in some way, you're saying, is safety, and security, and prosperity important for you and your family right. and your community? Yeah. And and so you're having him lead himself down the fact that he's discovering that wow, if I share where these bombs are, my priority is going to be taken care of. That's a good idea to do. Yeah. <laughs> 
there's another tool I would use is I would try to not be the smartest guy in the room. And if I felt like I knew everything, I would try to wipe that clean and, and start asking questions. And I'll give you an example. I was talking with an elder and we were talking about uh, his priorities. And he said, female education for young girls is the most important thing in the Valley. But first we have to start with the boys. And I'm, I easily could have wrote that down and been done with it and dismissed it. But I said, no, no, no I need to understand that because you're saying girls are the number one priority, but you have to start with boys. And he said, well, really, security comes before all of that. But boys right now have to work. They have to be educated. They have to have to have to. And girls are harder. So I'm going to put a lot of effort into girls, but it can't come before the boys because that's just well, that will never work here culturally. Right. And so whenever we approached any kind of female engagement with education, I had to keep that in mind as a Absolutely. universal norm in that whole valley, that whole region, because Absolutely. if you over pushed girls, you were going to compromise everything. Yeah. I mean, and this is this goes to the heart and core of how you connect with anyone. You can't judge their context. Yeah. That's the life. You know, you know, I I I, I talk about this a lot too, you know, anytime, a, you know, you did, again, you did your stuff, Oconus, I did my Oconus, but anytime a conflict broke out anywhere in the world, the first thing the FBI did is have to interview everyone from that country here. Mm-hmm. And most, you know, I remember when the Iraqi war broke out, you know, we had to interview every, every Iraqi in New York, you know, New York tri-state area, yeah. you know, and if you go in with a judgmental context of them why would they want to talk to you? Yeah. You know, I always ask myself, so why should someone want to talk to me? Yes. It's because I'm seeking their thoughts and opinions. I'm talking in terms of their priorities. I'm validating them without judging them and I'm giving them choices. Yeah. You know, and, and yeah, it, it's and after it's, it's people ask me, so how do you not judge someone? I said, well, spend 21 years practicing, not judging someone, because here's a guarantee. The second you do judge them, they're never going to share with you. Yeah. And what's the goal? Save lives, sell your product, Make a better brand, be a better father. I mean, it's it, these are such simple things. Stop judging. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 the, and the great thing is, you understand this too. It doesn't mean I'm agreeing with you, right? It means I'm seeking to understand you. Huge difference between the two. Huge difference. <laughs> yeah, huge difference. I, I always remind others, like when I'm we're on patrols, but you know, we don't know if we would be any different given the circumstances of growing up right yes. here. Most Both likely, mile my shoes. You know, yep. it's it's great to say I would never, but go be a professional athlete on the cusp of greatness and not take that pill. You right. Know? Like, yeah, there's tens and, of millions of dollars waiting for you if you do this. You know, that's I, I love doing this with cops all the time, too. I mean, I always you know, when I'm talking to law enforcement, I always I generally ask, I said, how many of you have gotten someone to confess when it wasn't in their best interest and it locked them up? All the hands go. I said, great. How many of you actually had? The people you locked up look you up first when they got out of jail to share with you how you changed their lives. And a lot of hands go up. I said, is it because you sat there and judged them? Yeah. Or you were or were you a resource for them? <laughs> yeah. I want to have like a, a clapping button. <laughs> we got lots of drop the bikes all over. <laughs> no, it's 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 again, it goes down to the elusive obvious. You know, I'm, every now and then I'm, I'm asked, you know, about what I think about elicitation techniques and you know the six month school we have for doing interviewing. And it, it, it befuddles me sometimes that, yeah, elicitation works, you can do it, but you're going to get a short-term gain for a long-term loss in, in brand, which is fine. Again, you just have to know the cause and effect of what you're doing yeah. uh, and know that, hey, if I need a short-term gain and, and I, I'm willing to ruin brand because I need this bit of information, then we can utilize these techniques. But just know <laughs> you're going to destroy a lot. The collateral damage is going to be pretty massive. And at the same time, though, you know, I always say, so why do we spend so much time learning how to deceive someone and manipulate them when all we're trying to do is build healthy relationships? So actually, we don't have to do that anymore. Right. Um, so it's, it's a, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's sophisticated. How long does it take for the agents that you worked with and trained? How long did it take for them to be practically able to do that in the field? I don't mean schoolhouse trained and, and knowledgeable. I mean, actually capable journeymen. I really think it depends on the office in which you're assigned and the things you're assigned to do. Um, like I'll be the first one to tell you, um, I was a horrible case agent, yeah. you know, uh, investigator. That's not my thing. I was an operator, you know, because, you know, some people, I had no idea what I was doing when I joined. I just, there's another way to continue my, my, my service to my country. I had no idea what the FBI did. I had no idea what counterintelligence was. And, you know, I was in a place where I had 
lots of opportunities for operations. You know, my job, you know, I think, I'm, you know, my job is to buy a lotto ticket every day because if you actually recruit a foreign intelligence officer, it's like hitting lotto. Yeah. That rare and that beneficial. My job every day was to buy a lotto ticket, you know, create operations so I could maybe be a resource for in line with their priorities and their priorities align with ours. That's all you're looking for every day. Yeah. So I had lots of practice with operations, interviewing, I, I'm fair to Midland on that yeah. because you know interviewing was a part of what I did, but my whole thing was I needed to recruit confidential human sources, which is not just the facts, ma'am. This is actually building. So my thing was building relationships. Now, other people that worked pure espionage investigations uh, that were just nothing but you know looking for facts, looking for data, and investigating, they had very little uh, human source development backgrounds because they're actually not doing that. It's not what the job and role was. So right. it's a different skill set entirely. Uh, it's not that it's unlearned or, or not learned. It's just different. So it really depended, I would say, on what you're assigned to do and then stick to it. You know, I, I think the adage is everyone knows, you know, if you do something about 10,000 times or 10 years, that's yeah. kind of when you start getting good at it. So guys and, and girls that would stay in the field for at least 10 years, no matter what discipline they're working, if they were about their business, I'd say that's a fair, fair place to say they're good. Yeah. But it was it's somewhere between that five and 10 year period is where you start becoming a journeyman at it. Um, if you ran to management prior to that, good luck. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, they start managing and, and trying to lead people that have skill sets that are beyond theirs. Uh, it's, yep. it's it really because, again, it comes down to what's your how's your ability to communicate and build a relationship with others rather than. You know, and it's, and it's not just my organization, any organization, you know, sometimes people run to leadership and management because they suck at being the first entry level. Well, I mean, you look at what our jobs are, you know, there's no syllabus, there's no, no. checklist. You just have to go out and you're like, I don't know anybody in this whole town. And I think your whole, your whole book starts off with friend or foe and, and trying to connect with right. people, you know? And, and that's, and that's what, you know, I, I always try to, you know, make the, the complex as easy as possible. I think it kind of brings full circle to what you said at the beginning with all this in-depth training and everything. Well, really, what's it all come down to? How do you build relationships? And there is a, you know, some people are the natural leaders in the world. They do it naturally. They're born with a skill set. They're built, they're born knowing how to make a conversation about everyone else but themselves. And for guys like me, I was born wanting to be that kind of person, but really sucked at it bad. You know, the, the only gift I was born with, I think, was um, enough humility to know I sucked. I didn't blame I didn't blame my failures on anyone else. I was like, all right, I suck. Yeah. <laughs> what do I need to do? And who do I need to study? Yes. And and just being placed in positions where I had to eventually teach others to do this. It was me teaching how to be like you know in the book. His name is Jesse Thorne. You know how to teach people how to be Jesse. How do I do that? Yeah. You know, instead of someone so instead of someone just saying, "Hey, just be a better leader, be a better interviewer, be better at recruiting people." All right, exactly how? You just had to assume knowledge. Well, build rapport and then do this. All right, build rapport. Go, give me the steps. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Now I can. I can tell you exactly what to do. Yeah. <laughs> how do you build trust? Easy. Seek your thoughts and opinions. Talk in terms of priorities. Validate without charging you and empowering you with choices. Ten steps to build a quick rapport. Use a time constraint. Talk in terms of their priorities, accommodating nonverbal, slower rate of speech. I mean, I can rattle the shit uh -huh. off. <laughs> yeah. 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 And no one could do it before. Build rapport. Build rapport. How? Go. How do I want to have it? You know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, and then who's running who? Because if I think I can build rapport reliably in two minutes or something, you know, hey, how are your kids? Oh, great. Well, let's get down to business. Fuck, there's no rapport there, you know? Yeah. It's my, my, my best test for that, too, is, is people ask me sometimes, well, how do you know someone's not trying to manipulate you? And I said, that's pretty easy. I'm, I'm looking for transparency. Yeah. You know, because I, I ask a lot of questions because uh, I am a moron. It takes me a long time. I'm, I'm slow on the uptake. And if I'm asking you questions because I'm looking for understanding and you're not willing to share and, and give me an understanding. So you have a lack of transparency. That means you we don't have trust in this lane yeah. and I'll stop engaging. You know, so if we don't even get to the point where I'm trying where someone's trying to manipulate me because I just stop because you're not looking for a healthy relationship in this lane. I'm done. Yeah. I'll, I'll wait here. What do you do? I mix in some of your buddy Joe Navarro's uh, stuff too, like his stuff on body uh -huh. language. And if you're telling me like you want to hug me, but you're closed off or your head's <laughs> turned, I'm going to, I know that's, I'm not at all a master of body language. There's things that I can see and they scream at me, 
But if I see things I don't understand, that's what I, I just I leave with questions. You know? Oh yeah. Hey, there's something here I'm missing. Let me. What right. am I missing? I might ask you that. What am I missing? And the person will say, "What do you mean?" And I'm like, "Well, I just you know, want to make sure I understand." You know, and then all of a sudden you have this whole different conversation going on, and you've taken, you know, I talk about like riding like a wild pony, and uh, I don't bridle it, I don't saddle it, I just kind of try to figure out how to ride it, and then slowly it, I get it to go where I want it to go, but within what it's comfortable doing, you know, it's on its path. I, I let because it what did you just do? You yeah. just made the conversation about them. In other yeah. words, you've, you, you picked up on something that you made them uncomfortable about because you picked up a non nonverbal of stress. Yes. Whether it's an eyebrow compression, lip compression, any blocking blading, anything coming in, you picked up that you induce stress by something you said or did or, or something in the environment. And now you're questioning, what did I do wrong by you? Yeah. And so who's that about? It's about them and people, you know, and the thing I love about this too is people aren't looking for you to be perfect. They're looking for you to make an effort. And when yeah. you demonstrate making these kinds of efforts, it's 99% of the people in the world are not. And all you got to be is that one person that is. We had a guy in Baghdad. We were looking for the Iranians because they were always trying to plant EFBs. Thanks, General Soleimani. Um, but anyhow, yeah. <laughs> we asked this guy about the Iranians and his arm climbed up, like wrapped around a pole. Like he uh -huh. locked himself in with his arm and then his leg as if he was like human ivy and he braced himself. And I was like, holy shit, this guy wow. is alerted. And so I slowed everything down. And ultimately, all we got was there in the immediate area. And that was all we got. But that was all we really needed was just to know that, like, hey, there could be trouble ahead. You know? Yeah. And, and and you can, and just by that reaction alone, you know how imminent it is, too. Right. I mean, that, that is a massive reaction. That is a massive nonverbal reaction. Yeah. That, is, that, that is reaction saying danger close right there. Yes. And that's why I slow down. I'm like, let's figure out what this is. And oh, that's when a time we're like, where are the bombs? You're, you're, you're two questions away from that, you know? And yeah. Trying to figure, because there could have been something in a tree. There could have been something in a car. We didn't know what it was. And we were able to reckon with what happened, but and ultimately nothing happened, ultimately. But that guy was terrified of the Iranians. Oh, yeah. the, the second that word came out, I didn't have to speak any Arabic to see that he had a problem with that. You know, so funny. it's so funny, too, you know, when you, you know, the, the first thing that popped into my mind, you know, what, you know, the questions I'd be, you know, I immediately become curious about is who in your immediate family or close relations are you most terrified for right now? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, because now that gets them again, that gets them talking about their priorities again, and it's going to get them wanting to share. You know, it's, it's funny that how do you make that? You know, again, it keeps going back to you, talking to other people about what's important to them. Mm -hmm. And so start to build that muscle memory about around their their circle of, of importance. Yeah. And, and all you're doing is being a resource for them protecting what's most important to them. Yeah, it's terrifying here. What keeps you up at night? Oh, my God. What a great question. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great question yeah and i set it up with the terrifying part i could take that out but what keeps you up at night and every parent has an answer to that right and also but by saying terrifying they might not see it terrifying but the fact that you're revealing to you it is yeah is showing openness and agreeableness so again you're showing again transparency without putting on a false or fake front so it's, it's making you look vulnerable and, and when people look vulnerable but have confidence yeah. that builds trust yeah and like I could add in the context with kids, you know, oh, like, yeah. man, I'm a parent. I don't know. I don't know what I would do with my kid. Like, how do you do this? How do you, how do you figure out what's safe for your kid to do? And then let them just expand from there. Now I'm talking about kids in school, you know, without, even, without coming in and saying, how often does your kid go to school? Like, Oh my God. That's the <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's what the military wants you to ask. But I find out much more detailed things. Hey, tell me how this really quickly here. Cause I don't want to take up yeah. too much of your time. Tell me how this stuff applies day to day for regular folks who aren't counterintelligence people. Sure. You know, it, it it's, most notably, I think it really helps mostly in the workplace, you know, so size and people have, I got a, I got a, every chapter, you know, each one of these signs, I talk about all the different tells of, of what is good that you're looking for in a relationship with someone. It's, it's giving you some, some bads that can happen as well, you know? And so like the, the first one, you know, sign one vested, you know, I, you know, when I, I remember the first boss I worked for in New York City, uh, what a great guy. Like every day he's asking me about, you know, where I saw myself in five years, you know, what kind of training. He's always looking for opportunities to get me into training so I can be successful. Uh, he's looking to, you know, making sure I was a good fit on the squad 
If not, he wanted to see where I could go. He's making sure I had a good car to get home and, you know, every night, you know, to and from the city from, you know, so this guy was actually looking out for me. He was vested in my career and future and also longevity. He wanted to, you know, see what he could do to eventually get me to be the primary relief on the squad. You know, so it's all that kind of things investing were, were really good. Um, I'm telling you, the reliability one is really high as well as confidence and diligence. You know, we see this all the time. You know, I remember right before I retired, uh, has has helping a guy out that was trying to put a conference together. And he was chosen for this because he had a lot of good skill sets you know, technically in the area um, that we're trying to have this thing. And it was really with UAVs. It was a drone conference. And but man. He had zero people skills. And so, and his organizational people skills are horrendous. And this thing started falling apart. And that combined with his lack of diligence uh, on this for the sign as well. I mean, he was, man, he, and we've seen this all seen this at work. You know, he could, he could talk a mile a minute and sell, you know, snow to the snowmen. But when it actually came to doing something, it was vacant. You know, so that's that's a reliability sign. So we see these things, you know, positively, and negatively all over our lives. And so all, all this book does is, is helps you understand others at that deeper level in all these different situations. So you can reasonably assess what can I expect from this person. So you manage your own expectations. So you live a calmer, easier, peaceful life and know who you can you know align with and who you should probably avoid. The book is called Sizing People Up. It's written by Robin Dreek. And it's just it, all the, and I've got the book right here in my hand. I'm showing it to Robin. Thank you for this, by the way. If you guys want to understand how guys like us do what we do in these impossible situations, um, Code of Trust, Sizing People Up, these, these two books will give you a lot of homework if you want to improve <laughs> your relationships at work, uh, with peers or whatever it is. And, and you'll have a fascinating read because it's just, He's practically done this stuff. He's taught people how to do it. There is no better way to master something. And you can hear us talking and agreeing and common experience. You know, we didn't know each other two years ago, but we had very similar paths. And our fence building, our fence joining has gone on because we've done this stuff. We've seen it. I, I can attest you guys should buy this book. You will absolutely love it. Thanks a lot. And uh, the greatest thing I did with this one to make it easier on everyone, matter of fact, I did it for myself. At the end of each chapter is a chapter debriefing where you got all the signs, you got the 10 tells for, the 10 tells against, you got a key quote, key message. And so I literally, I copied and printed out the chapter debriefings for each of the six signs and I carry them with me yeah. <laughs> because there's a lot in there. There's a lot in there. It's super dense. With the, I mean, I was going through the book as we were talking and yeah, the, these briefings are great. I, I love Thanks. them. Yeah. yeah, I love them too. Well, listen, I appreciate you coming Thanks, on. Thank Pete. you so much. I'll let you get back to the rest of your day. Everybody, go out and buy Sizing People Up and or Code of Trust. You're going to buy both of them anyhow. So just buy the two-pack. <laughs> Man, thank you. I, Robin, I just can't – I, I love it. I love getting a chance to hang out and talk with you. And uh, I'm so fortunate that, that we got a chance to finally meet and, and, uh, and cross paths. Well, not face-to-face, but our, our professional paths are just so similar, and I just love it. Absolutely, Pete. Me too. I got goosebumps every time I talk to you. It's like, it's like talking to a brother from another mother. No All doubt. right. <laughs> <laughs>